actually working out to be very good timing uh, with Tony's course, the fact that um, you went over elliptic curves and the Diffie-Hellman elliptic curve um, protocol this morning and, for example, the group law on elliptic curves. So all of that is going to be very relevant um, for some of the things we're going to talk about now. So let me just uh, remind you that my plan was to have two lectures each on, um, on uh, uh, two on super singular isogeny graphs and two on lattice-based crypto, which were two of the main uh, proposals for post-quantum crypto. And my plan was kind of a, each time on the first day to introduce the definitions and the motivation and the applications, and then on the second day to talk about the hard problems. I actually didn't get to finish the applications yesterday, so I'm going to add in one of the uh, applications today as well. And then on Thursday and Friday, we'll talk about lattice-based cryptography, which is very related to Jill's colloquium talk um, yesterday afternoon. And um, so just as a reminder, kind of what we did yesterday, we just kind of introduced cryptography, the various um, protocols in public key cryptography that we're interested in that are going to be standardized in the PQC competition, the key exchange, signatures, and encryption. Um, and then kind of we talked about quantum computers and the motivation of quantum cryptography and the NIST competition that just started this past year. Um, and then I actually did a little detour when I talked about cryptographic hash functions because that motivated the construction of um, using super singular isogeny graphs for the first time in cryptography. And so for super singular isogeny graphs, we kind of did a very, very high level definition. I told you kind of what a graph is, what the hard problem was in the graph, the kind of routing problem. Um, mentioned a kind of very high level description of elliptic curves. So now you've talked a lot more today about elliptic curves. What are they? Um, uh, J invariants, which are the labels for our elliptic curves for our graph. Um, isogenies, which are the maps between the elliptic curves, which will make up the edges of the graph. And then in the review session yesterday, you did, you actually computed a two isogeny from a two torsion point. So you got a chance to really compute one of these edges in the graph. So how many people successfully computed the two isogeny? Some? OK, good, good. <laughs> um, so even if you didn't compute it, um, just remember that the idea of the isogenies is, I guess I have kind of a little bit of a reminder of what the graph was. Remember, the nodes of the graph were elliptic curves. They're actually isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. They have a label, which is the J invariant. And the edges are these isogenies. What I told you yesterday was isogenies are these basically homomorphisms that are characterized by their kernel. That doesn't really talk about the geometry. When Serena talked about it a little more precisely in the review session, she said that they're actually morphisms of, of curves. Um, and if you just insist that they take the identity to the identity, you can actually prove that they're a homomorphism. Um, and a key uh, piece of information is the degree of the isogeny. And yesterday in my talk, I told you that the degree is just the size of the kernel. So whenever we say L isogeny, where L is going to be, L is always going to be prime, generally a small prime, like L equals 2, for example. And P is always going to be our very, very large cryptographic size prime, where the elliptic curves are defined over that field, either FP or FP squared. Let's see if this pointer works. No, I don't think the pointer works. Oh, well, FP or FP squared. OK, so that was the reminder. So remember that the hard problem for the hash function, there were kind of two issues. One was uh, finding collisions in the hash function. Uh, you want your cryptographic hash functions to be collision resistant so that um, people can't um, uh, find you know, basically two passwords that hash to the same thing. So you, they'd be able to get a false password through the test. Um, and the second um, uh, kind of uh, motivation for cryptographic hash functions was that it should be hard to find pre-images. So um, in general, we have um, square root attacks against almost all of our public key crypto systems. And actually, I forgot to ask Tony if you, um, when you were going to, you were going to cover square root attacks on Thursday. Yes. Is that right? Yes. 
OK, so I'm just going to say a little bit about this. Um, so the, 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 um, the idea of uh, walking on the graph, remember the way the hash function works is, is that you'll have some input string. And if, um, if you look actually on the review sheet from yesterday for our course, the second um, review a problem that Serena put in there was to show that for L isogenies, uh, so you're, you're going to quotient by a subgroup of order L. Um, there's an exercise in there to show that there's actually L plus 1 choices for those subgroups. And so um, that's why yesterday I said that these graphs are L plus 1 regular. So every, anywhere you are at one of these elliptic curves, you have a choice. You can quotient by an L, L torsion subgroup, and you'll get one of these other elliptic curves, and there are L plus 1 choices. So in this case, for L equals 2, that means there's three arrows coming out of every, or three edges, I should say, they're undirected, coming out of every node. And I also told you that when you walk along the graph, you're not allowed to backtrack. So that means that wherever you came from, you only have two choices where you can go. And those two choices can be determined just by one bit. So this is a particularly nice kind of easy version of the hash function because you can just read off the bit string bit by bit, and it just tells you where to walk in the graph. So um, as you're walking along this graph, oops, you'll, and then you'll, you'll end up somewhere. That's the end point of your walk. And so to avoid collisions, what you're trying to do is to avoid a graph where you have the possibility of walking around w one way and getting to this node here, or walking around this other way and kind of getting there via another path. And these two paths are now kind of colliding paths. They end at the same point, so the hash function will have the same value. So that's the kind of collision problem in these graphs, collision resistance. And um, we, but we can state these things also in terms of um, the kind of elliptic curves and in terms of the kind of algebraic geometry. So what I was, what I was going to do today is I'm going I'm to talk a little bit about the hardness of these problems, both, both generically and also specifically in terms of number theory, some of the number theoretic tools that we can use to think about that. But a lot of this part of the lecture will probably not be extremely accessible to undergraduates. If you really never had any elliptic curves or um, algebraic geometry before, you might not follow everything that I'm saying here. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more, more later or during the review session um, with people individually. Um, but then I'm going to come back to the applications again, and I'm going to talk about key exchange. And that should be accessible again um, to everyone. So. Let me just state these problems anyway in terms of the kind of the algebraic geometry. So you know, I, sh I showed you the picture. This is the picture of what we're kind of trying to avoid. And um, so what does this actually translate to? So uh, we stated in our original 2006 paper, problem one, which is to produce a pair of supersingular elliptic curves, E1 and E2, and two distinct isogenies of degree L to the n between them. So that's exactly this picture. That's uh, two colliding walks, basically, because the isogenies that if you take the composition of all of these isogenies, these two compositions are different. Um, so problem number two, you can state in terms of, if, um, so this is a little bit interesting. So um, this gets into the definition of the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve. And that's going to be very fundamental for the next uh, five or 10 slides or so of what we're going to talk about. So the problem, too, is given an elliptic curve, a super, uh, sorry, a super singular elliptic curve, um, it's to find an endomorphism of E of degree L to the, not L to the n for n steps, but L to the 2n for 2n steps, which is not the multiplication by L to the n map. OK, so this, this um, statement uh, requires a little bit of explanation. So first of all, um, we're going to be uh, saying, ag talking again and again about the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve today. And um, that is the collection of, so there are you know, morphisms of, of the curve, but they're also, the elliptic curve has this group structure. So they also have to respect that group structure. So when you think of endomorphisms, endomorphism is just a map from the curve to itself. So here we have 
f uh, goes from e to e, um, respecting the group structure. Um, and we are, you, you talked about the group law today. So can anybody think of any natural endomorphisms of an elliptic curve? Somebody said something. Doubling, yes. So doubling takes a point and multiplies it by two. It really, it actually just adds it to itself. Two times a point is just P plus P. Okay, let's have another natural map. The identity. identity is always a good answer, yes. <laughs> yes. Exactly, so multiplication by any other integer. So multiplication by three. And that really just means adding p to itself, p plus p plus p. So what you always have is to basically take, and, and we also know how to negate a point, right? So we can also take like multiplication by, you know, minus two, which is minus p plus minus p. So uh, we have all of the integers that we can use that are gonna give us natural endomorphisms of an elliptic curve. And that, that's not true in general of a curve, right? You, can't, uh, you don't necessarily have a group law. You don't necessarily have you know, endomorphisms that are so nice like this. So um, the elliptic curves that just have those natural maps, the, the actual multiplication by a scalar is what we call it, those are, that's what we call the kind of um, uh, ordinary case. And in, in um, we're going to talk today about what it really means to be super singular, and that's where you need to think about the endomorphism ring, and it's actually a little bit bigger. But before we get to that, I'm just going to say what this means is, is that if you go back to this picture, and if you go around in, in a, a, a loop, that, that would actually give you, because these have arrows because I was talking about the fact that we were walking, but these are really undirected edges, so you can go either way. And so when you get back up here, you will have created an endomorphism of this curve, which is not just multiplication by some scalar. So that's what the statement of problem two is. How do you know it's not multiplication by a scalar? Um, oh, okay, so actually, um, well, one thing is you could probably just um, see it in terms of the, um, the uh, we did some computations of, of, of this, or you can kind of see what the, um, what the ones which are um, dividing by, or sorry, just multiplication by a scalar. Um, if you look at all of the possible, so this will be an L, it'll correspond to quotient by an L to the 2n uh, subgroup, of which there are many of those, and the ones which are um, just multiplication by a scalar are, are very simple in terms of what they look like, and this will not be one of those. Is that in your paper with Charles and Doran? When you say we those Oh, no, actually, this is very recent. I'm going to talk about this a little oh. bit. Is the um, my uh, Win4 group. We did a bunch of computations of this kind of thing, so it's kind of neat. Um, okay, so problem number three is given two super singular elliptic curves. Um, just to find an isogeny of degree L to the n between them. So that's just the pathfinding problem that I mentioned yesterday. Okay, so the best known attacks on this problem uh, generically right now are these kind of square root attacks. And because you're going to talk more about square root attacks um, on Thursday with Tony, I'm just going to kind of try to give you the idea of the, um, yeah, so. The way that the square root attacks work in cryptography, like for example, Pollard Row, you can think of it as kind of walking around. And if you're taking a random walk, just like we have the kind of birthday paradox that you expect to get a collision within roughly square root of the size of, of the group, what will happen is, is that if you're just kind of walking around, you expect to kind of randomly collide with yourself you know, uh, ev eventually within roughly square root of uh, p times, where p is roughly the size of the graph. OK, so let me make a couple of comments about that. So first of all, just to make it a little bit more concrete, I remember when I used to teach uh, number theory at the University of Michigan undergraduate number theory class, I, um, I like to illustrate, Poll so Pollard Row relies on the birthday paradox, so I like to illustrate the birthday paradox by asking for the birth dates of everyone in the room. And so you're supposed to see that it would take you, you know, roughly the square root of the number of people in the room in order to get a collision in the birth dates. 
Um, but unfortunately, in my undergraduate number theory class that I was teaching, um, there was a pair of twins there. <laughs> and I very happily asked them each what their birthday was, which was very silly. So, so anyway, <laughs> note to self, don't try to illustrate the birthday paradox when there's twins in the room. But other than that, like here we have, I don't know, somewhere, I think we have somewhere around 75 people in the room. So if I started asking everybody's birthdays, we would expect to get a collision within something like square root of the number of, birthday, of, the number of people. So this is kind of that same idea where what would happen in a kind of a generic square root attack is, is that let's say you're trying to find a path between this node and this node. So what you could do is you could start out walking from both nodes until uh, kind of walking along, but keep track of your path, right? So you're Hansel and Gretel in the woods and you keep track of your path by dropping your breadcrumbs so you remember these paths. And that's the same idea that you see in Pollard Row as well. So what, what you're looking for is, is that as you walk along from each side, you're keeping track of your paths and you're waiting until you collide. So when you collide, you have now found a path between these two nodes. Now, again, just to relate to our lecture yesterday about um, running times of algorithms and polynomial time running times. So we generally can use problems in cryptography when there's this kind of asymmetry between how much space and computation time it takes you to state and implement the problem versus ho hopefully an exponential amount of time that it would take an attacker to solve the problem. That's the kind of asymmetry that we're looking for fundamentally. And so the way that we get that is, for example, here, here's a nice example of this, but it's very different than the traditional RSA or ECC. So you can think about RSA and ECC in your head. But when you think about this one, what I've told you is, is that if we fix a large prime P, so again, P is usually going to be around 256 bits, there are going to be roughly P over 12 um, isomorphism classes of supersingular elliptic curves modulo p, which means over um, fp bar. And all of them have a j invariant or a representative that's defined either over fp or fp squared. So there's roughly p over 12 of them. And there's actually like the greatest integer part of p over 12 plus either 0, 1, or 2, I think. So it's really roughly p over 12. So think about that. That's 2 to the 256 divided by 12. The 12 is pretty irrelevant, right? It's just a couple of bits. Um, so you've got a huge graph, 2 to the 256 size graph. And if it takes you square root of that size to find this collision, that's pretty good, because that's around 2 to the 128. So that's why you can kind of set the parameters to be around this size, 256 bits, because the best attacks that we know are roughly these kind of square root attacks. So the, um, the, uh, the um, the square root, like I said, you know, the square root of the number of people in, in this room is, you know, is what did, what did we say? There's about 75, roughly 75 people. So, you know, it would probably take us only like, eight, you know, eight or nine people until we would, we would get a collision. Whereas here we're saying it's going to take you like two to the power 128 before you would get a collision. But on the other hand, how efficient is it to implement this? I've told you the labels of these things are just J invariants, which are elements of FP or FP squared. So that means it takes you only like either log P bits to write it down or like two log P bits to write it down. And the isogenies that you computed yesterday, the two isogenies, you could probably see it only cost you a couple of multiplications in these, in these base fields, either log. Eh, basically an FP or an FP squared. And, and multiplications only cost you about log P operations. So it's that nice asymmetry that we're exploiting here for the, um, the security of our systems. OK, so here's the part um, that's going to go into a little bit more of the, of the algebra of this thing. Um, so I'd like to kind of convince you how this graph that I described in terms of elliptic curves is related to another object, which is very beautiful, which is a cl the collection of maximal orders in a quaternion algebra. So first of all, like we said, the endomorphism ring of the elliptic curve is all of the um, um, maps from the elliptic curve to itself, which is respect to the group law. And now I'm finally going to give you the actual definition of supersingular. I kind of mentioned it briefly yesterday. 
So we say an elliptic curve is super singular if essentially if it has extra endomorphisms mod p. So what happens is that the, is that the elliptic curve um, has an endomorphism ring, which is actually a non-commutative endomorphism ring of rank 4 over z. It's actually going to be a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. So many of you may not have um, worked with quaternion algebras before. H how many people know, know about quaternion algebras? Oh, good. So some, some at least, yes. Um, so I wanted to at least start with an example for those of you that are not as familiar with quaternion algebras. So in the, in the case that p is congruent to 3 modulo 4, if you take this particular elliptic curve, E0, where y squared equals x cubed plus x, um, it has j invariant equal to 1728. It's one of the very special ones. And it is super singular mod p if p is 3 mod 4. And its endomorphism ring is actually very special. So I guess there's two things that I should say. I have a kind of a continuation of this example here. So there are two endomorphisms that you can kind of see on this curve mod p. So one thing is, I, didn't, I, I, I forgot that I should really explain this. So the, when you're talking about curves or, in general, algebraic varieties over FP, you always have what are ca called the Frobenius map. So Frobenius is very nice. Look what it does. It just takes coordinate-wise, it takes everything to the pth power. Now, if this was a point on the curve, and the curve had coefficients in FP, um, it was a point on the curve because it, it satisfied the equation, right? And if you raise everything to the pth power, the coefficients that defined the curve, because they were in FP, they would um, still be, they'd be fixed by this map. So what happens is, is that when you take um, the Frobenius over um, the field of definition of the curve, you get a map uh, which just raises things coordinate-wise to the pth power. So whenever, I might have even said this yesterday, but whenever you have um, a curve over a finite field, an elliptic curve in, gen in, per in particular, over a finite field, you have the Frobenius endomorphism, which is this kind of extra endomorphism. So already, you have more than just z. You have, we usually call this pi. You have z adjoined pi as your endomorphism ring. But that's only rank 2 over z. So that's, and it's still commutative. So you'll have z was the integers, all multiplication by any scalar, and pi was this Frobenius. And now what happens is, is that for some curves that are very special, you actually have another endomorphism. And this one is not going to commute with the Frobenius. So it's going to give you very, very concretely a rank 4 um, algebra, which is the endomorphism ring, which happens to be in one-to-one -one correspondence. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more in a minute about that with the maximal orders in a quaternion algebra. So for this particular curve, remember our curve was, um, this example was y squared equals x cubed plus x. So if you look here, what happens if you take a point x comma y and um, you just leave y alone, but you multiply, um, or, or sorry, actually, you, you multiply I, uh, y by i, which will m turn that into a minus. But both of the terms involving x were j just had odd degree. So you could just send x to minus x. And so this is a per perfectly good endomorphism, which is non-trivial. So, um, and i is the usual, i squared is minus 1. So this is another endomorphism ring. And when you generally, when you think of an elliptic curve and you write down some random equation, it doesn't have some nice endomorphism like this that you can describe easily. Um, so this is a particularly special case. I called this E0 for now. This is the elliptic curve E0. Um, because what, now what I'd like to do is to actually describe how you can think of these endomorphism rings as being they have a z basis, and you can actually think of them. I said they're rank four. They're actually non-commutative. And you can actually think of them as being an order in a quaternion algebra. So let me very briefly just say a little bit about quaternion algebras. Um, this is a typical notation. If you ever see this, BP infinity refers to a particular definite quaternion algebra. 
uh, which is ramified only at PN infinity. And it's very, uh, it's related to, for example, um, the, uh, like the Hilbert symbol. So you, in number theory, it's something that you kind of, it comes up naturally. And the way it's defined is, is you're going to have two um, numbers A and B, which are going to define the quaternion algebra. The basis for the quaternion algebra is going to be 1 i j and then i times j, where i squared is going to be a, j squared is going to be b, uh, and i j is minus j i. So you can see it's, it's non-commutative. And in, there's a lot of, um, there's, you have to kind of break it down by cases to say exactly what A and B should be so that you can get a quaternion algebra that's exactly ramified at PN infinity. But for example, for, we're going to just focus on this example when P is congruent to 3 mod 4, because I, I gave you this nice elliptic curve E0 in this case that we're looking at. And here you can just take A is equal to minus P and B is equal to minus 1. And then the maximal order in the quaternion algebra, at least an, a maximal order, can be written very explicitly like, like this in this form. So um, another very important thing to know about quaternion algebras is they have um, a, um, a reduced norm map. There's actually a reduced trace and a reduced norm, but I didn't, didn't get into the re reduced trace. Uh, but the norm map is kind of very, very special. It takes, in this case, when the, the quaternion algebra has this very nice basis where this is A and B are given by these, uh, look, it has this very nice uh, norm, norm map, which just takes, if you have something expressed in terms of the basis of the quaternion algebra, it just is this um, nice, always positive, <laughs> positive definite quadratic form, basically. So um, in general, there's a whole beautiful theory of Clifford algebras and everything that you can talk about here, which I'm not going to talk about at all today. But um, these, every maximal order, you can actually, using the, base, using the specific basis for the maximal order, you can actually write down the norm form that's associated with that particular maximal order. This is just the norm form for the general quaternion algebra. So um, there is a reason, I do have a reason for mentioning this. Let me come back to that in, the minute, in a minute. But the reason that I kind of wanted to introduce these quaternion algebras is to be able to talk about Dürings correspondence. So this is kind of uh, fairly important for the security of this proposal, super singular isogeny graphs. And the reason is because the way I described the graph to you was in terms of the elliptic curves. But there's actually another description of this same graph and that is in terms of maximal orders in these quaternion algebras. And that's just by taking the during correspondence just takes a supersingular elliptic curve and it associates to it its endomorphism ring. And its endomorphism ring, that's the, that's the definition I gave you of a supersingular elliptic curve is, is that its endomorphism ring is a rank for um, a maximal order in a quaternion algebra. The quaternion algebra was BP infinity, the one I described on the previous slide. So um, the during correspondence goes, goes further. And as long as the degree, the, I should say, as long as the, um, the degree of the isogenies are co-prime to the characteristics. So let's always assume that so we don't get any kind of problems. Then you also have this very nice one-to-one uh, -one correspondence between um, actual isogenies, which are these edges in our graph, and left ideals of this particular maximal order in the quaternion algebra. So now we have a totally different description of the same graph. So forget about the elliptic curves and the isogenies. Instead, now we have vertices, which are maximal orders, and edges, which are just these, um, these ideals, left ideals. And that's it. And so one kind of nice thing is, is that I often call this graph, I think you might have seen on one of my slides, uh, yesterday, um, Pizer's graph. And that's because Pizer worked on this from the point of view of quaternion algebras, and he described even much more general constructions of graphs, which could also be proved to be Ramanujan, where um, you don't even have to take maximal orders. So he takes Eichler orders in general. So that's, um, that's just kind of an aside. You don't need to worry about that. But there's a lot of beautiful kind of algebra behind this area. 
So um, just to kind of finish up on, on, our, on our example here, so I started, started this example. Um, so in this particular case, this is exactly what the maximal order is, um, for, if for the, which gives you the endomorphism ring. And um, there's the, this, this map tells you exactly what the um, correspondence is. So, and again, this is not something which is easy to do in general. This is a very special elliptic curve where we can make everything very concrete. We have these endomorphisms that I called pi and phi. Pi was the Frobenius, phi is, is this one, this special one. And the isomorphism in this case that associates the endomorphism ring with, um, with the actual maximal order is that um, basically phi corresponds to i and pi corresponds to j, and ij is then pi phi. So the other correspondence that goes along with this, I've, I've briefly mentioned two things on the two sides of the two different descriptions of the graph. One was I mentioned the norm map on quaternions, and the other is on the, um, on the isogeny side, I mentioned the degree map. So I said if we have an isogeny, its degree is the size of its kernel. So um, now that we know, now that we have this correspondence between isogenies and ideals, um, it's nice to also know that there's a correspondence between that degree map and the norm map, and they actually match up. So uh, go ahead, question. I'm sorry. Um, so when you have these O ideals, they, like, I mean, I assume they can be fractional, but you normally just take representatives as integrals. Is that how it works? I'm sorry? Yes. Well, that's a good question, but um, <coughs> not exactly. So the way, so what you do is, if you have a basis, um, so here, here is an example of a basis, and you could see the the basis already was not integral, but this is a z basis. So whenever you would, if you want an element of this order, you're right, it's, it does have some denominators. Um, but if you write it like this, where C, D, F, and G were integral, then you could um, write out this norm form. And now it would have some denominators in it, right? Because these guys had denominators. And then you just kind of pull out the denominators and kind of rewrite it if you, if you want to. You can rewrite the norm form so that it looks integral. Okay, so that way you make, you sort of, okay, so, but then when you're dealing with the ideals, are they necessarily <coughs> contained in O, or do you take a representative that's contained in O? Or? No, not necessarily. So ideals, I didn't have time to kind of go into all the background on quaternion algebras, but ideals in the quaternion algebra are actually fractional, yeah. so you're not trying to get an uh, integral representative. Okay, so where were we? So, okay, so all we've done really is to give an example of this correspondence. I told you about the correspondence, and I also told you that the kind of the norm map matches, matches up with the degree map. So all of this is kind of a little bit of background, is, is a little bit of an aside. Why is this relevant? Why did I give you this other description of the graph? Well, here's the problem. So in 2014, in ANTS, um, with Cole and Petit and Tignol, we showed that we could figure out how to find a pathfinding um, algorithm in the maximal order description of the graph. So then you might say, well, uh-oh, looks like this is the same graph, and now you have a pathfinding algorithm. And what's really interesting is, is that it turns out that um, this is just a really hard problem to do this during correspondence explicitly. So given an elliptic curve to actually find its endomorphism ring, either as a basis, giving a basis in the quaternion algebra or in terms of the explicit maps, um, that this problem in itself is really hard. So, and this is kind of the reason I also mentioned the norm map. So this is something that even going back to, I think it was around 2003, um, with Ken McMurdy, I'd written a paper about hardness of computing endomorphism rings. 
And it was also at the same time, um, the same result was essentially found by uh, Servigno. And uh, both papers are publicly available. And I, I believe the Servigno paper is published. Um, but the technique that we have for computing endomorphism rings of elliptic curves, so here you have a super singular elliptic curve. You know its endomorphism ring is some quaternion algebra, but you don't know what it is. And if you could do this correspondence on both sides, then you could use the pathfinding algorithm that we found in the, in the um, description of the graph over there and the quaternions, and then you could just come back. But in order to find um, the endomorphism ring, here was kind of the algorithm that we suggested. And this is kind of, a, from a, a running time point of view, it's an absolutely terrible algorithm. So what you can do is you can actually compute what we call the representation numbers for the, the number of elements of norm n and also the number uh, compare it with the number of isogenies of various degrees. So going back to the, this correspondence, um, I, we had uh, shown these, well, I'll go back to this picture actually. This is a nice way to show it is, is that remember, that an endomorphism, you could end up finding an endomorphism if you kind of walk around this graph and you end, end up back at yourself. So that, was, that would be an endomorphism. And you would know what the degree is because each step is an L isogeny and you just keep track of the number of steps. So that would be an L to the N, um, L, L to the N endomorphism. But in general, what you can do is you can compute um, both of these. Uh, both of these numbers. So what does this mean, compute representation numbers? This means that um, you compute, uh, stick in various choices for this, uh, for this norm form here. I define the norm form. So take all kinds of elements, uh, which are specified by C, D, F, and G, and compute uh, these norms. And then count how many did you find that had each norm, norm 1, norm 2, norm 3, norm 4 all the way up. And those numbers are called the representation numbers. You could call them a sub n. So a sub n is just the number of elements in the quaternion of, of norm n. And actually, with a lot, I'm sweeping a lot of beautiful mathematics under the rug here, these representation numbers actually are the coefficients of modular forms. So these, this is actually specifying a modular form. And this modular form, these, the, the, another way to think about those same representation numbers would be on your elliptic curve side, you would compute the number of endomorphisms of that uh, that have degree equal to the, the representation number. However, we know um, an upper bound on the number of coefficients that it takes to specify a modular form. And in this space of modular forms, where this particular modular form lies, the answer is the number of coefficients it takes to specify it is square root of, roughly square root of p. So that was an upper bound. And actually, um, with my intern Travis last summer, we did some pretty extensive computations as, as far up as we could to see whether this upper bound is actually met. Like, do you really need square root of p coefficients in order to specify this modular form? And experimentally, the answer is yes. So I had kind of hoped, well, that's an upper bound. Maybe it's actually just a really bad upper bound. Maybe we'll be able to prove a better upper bound. But what that shows is that this algorithm is a really, really bad. It's an exponentially bad algorithm for solving the problem of finding the endomorphism ring. Because you're going to have to compare the coefficients, uh, the, these representation numbers, all the way up to n being roughly square root of p, where n was. 2 to, the one, uh, 2 to the 256. So that's bad. That's a very bad algorithm. So, but that's good news for the security of this system in, the, in some sense. However, the fact is what this approach illustrates is, is that there is a lot of deep mathematics underneath these constructions. And some approach may work to find a new way to kind of break this system. And in general, we have seen again and again that having a lot of extra structure in cryptography is bad. And I think Tony said that to me in the car on the way home after dinner yesterday, right? So structure can be very dangerous because it gives you a lot of extra ways to attack this problem. OK, so that, that's that part of the lecture that I wanted to cover is, is that, and I haven't covered, there are several other things that we have thought about from the number theoretic point of view, but they, 
This is um, what I worked partly on in this Win4 project, which I'd like to talk about next, but I'm not going to go into the other, the other approaches that we've thought about for attacking this. But I mean, I've given this talk to, not this talk, but a similar talk to number theory audiences. People have come up to me afterwards and said, well, have you tried you know, modular symbols? Or have you tried this or that? So I mean, I think there are a lot of ideas out there that could be used. And that shows that it's a, ripe, it's a very ripe topic to, to work on, to, to keep thinking about. OK, so now I'd like to turn back to um, the applications part. And I think this is pretty important, because I motivated um, talking about super singular isogeny graphs by telling you about the NIST competition, post-quantum crypto uh, solutions. And, but I also told you that there were three tracks in the competition, right? Key exchange, encryption, and signatures. And then I told you about super singular isogeny graphs, and I only talked about the application to cryptographic hash functions, which was not one of the tracks, right? So let me relate it back to the NIST competition and the actual submission to the NIST competition that's based on super singular isogeny graphs. So in 2011, Zhao and DeFeo uh, introduced a key exchange um, as, and I'm not going to talk about, um, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the encryption and the signatures uh, constructions here. I'm just going to talk about the key exchange, which is the one with the submission to the, hash or to the NIST competition. OK, so this is going to be a picture of the key exchange. I'll come back. I'll show you what this picture means. So this is how we're going to set up a key exchange. So you did, you did Diffie-Hellman key exchange this morning, right? So um, this abstractly, just before you look at all this notation, just think about a key exchange. Key exchange is two parties. They, each can, they can have some public information, but they're each going to generate some secret information. And they're going to compute something, and they're going to share that publicly so that any eavesdropper can see. And then at the end, they're both supposed to have something that they can compute that's the same, that's secret. So that's the whole idea of the key exchange. And this is just like a slightly more complicated version of Diffie-Hellman. So this is um, sometimes called, um, well, S-I-K-E is super singular isogeny key exchange, or S-I-D-H, super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. Um, and so. What we're going to do is we're going to specify our large prime p. And in this case, p is going to need to be larger than it was for the hash function. And I'll kind of indicate why in a minute. Um, it's going to be a pr um, of the following form. Some prime l sub a and some prime l sub b are specified. They're different from each other, definitely different from p. p is large. These are small. And then we're going to need a prime, which is um, some large power of these guys uh, multiplied together plus 1. So it's L sub A to the M times L sub B to the N plus 1. And the fact is, is that this, um, these M and N, the, the power that you take of these primes, um, should be relatively balanced. You want them to be close to each other. But you can play around with them. And the size of this prime is related to the security of the system, as you could kind of see from our discussion before. And so what you want to do is you want to choose the rough security that you want, the rough size of the prime. And then you want to look for choices of these primes, LA and LB, and these integers, M and N, such that so, uh, an integer of this form is actually prime. So you might need to check a few until you find one. And in particular, what we're going to do um, for the basic case, the basic ap application, just think about L sub A is equal to 2, and L sub B is equal to 3. So just two small primes. You could take 3 and 5 or, or whatever, but just think of two small prim primes. They're fixed now. So P is still very large, and it's related to them, but they, they are fixed. So now we have our two parties, A and B, and they want to exchange a key. So the first stage, I have like green and red. So green is for public parameters. Red is for secret parameters. So um, the green uh, part is, is they're going to do some computation and make some things public. One thing they're going to do is they're going to pick generators for the torsion. So that's another topic that we kind of haven't covered. But if you know L is prime uh, to P, then the, two tor the L torsion 
is, um, has rank two on elliptic curves. So you just need uh, two generators. And by the way, I haven't said anything about what field these points are defined over in general, over a finite field. You might have to go up to some large extension field in order to find the L torsion. You could think about that from a group theory point of view, right? Everything's finite here. You have an elliptic curve over a finite field. It has a group order. So you can't have L torsion points if L doesn't divide the, the size of the group, right? And in particular, the whole, you definitely won't find the whole L torsion until you have a group Z mod L cross Z mod L sitting in the group of points of the elliptic curve. So you may, in general, you may have to go up to a large extension to find the L torsion. But these have been picked in such a way, this, this property um, was de designed so that you can find this L torsion already over the small field that you're dealing with. So these points PA and QA are going to generate um, this L to the M torsion or the L to the N torsion for B, and they're public. So everybody knows the generators of the torsion. And now here's where the secret comes. So a is going to pick two integers, MA and NA, and B is going to pick two integers, MB and NB. And here's what they're going to do. They're going to compute a secret isogeny. So now they um, take their integers, they multiply them by these two points. That everybody knows the two points, but only they know the integers. So now to, all together, they have this L to the M torsion point here. OK, so sorry about all the notation, but the, I'm trying to get the idea across. That they're going to compute, their, A is going to compute its own secret isogeny because it knows these integers. And it does that by taking this linear combination of these points and quotienting by the subgroup generated by that. And then B does the same thing. So now what the two parties have done is they've basically computed the, like the first step of the key exchange where there was a public elliptic curve E, super singular elliptic curve. Um, they each computed E sub A and E sub B. And these guys were the secret. This is the thing that nobody else knows. So does this kind of look familiar? Like a couple of public elliptic curves and uh, some secrets which correspond to the path between them? Uh -huh. Right? So it, it should look familiar. Um, OK, so now let's finish the key exchange. How do you get a key, key exchange out of this? So what they actually do is A is now going to compute these points. So since everybody knows PB and QB and PA and QA, the, the public points, these guys, in particular, A can take B's public points and compute the image of them under its own secret map. It's in red because that's the map that only A knows. And vice versa, B could do the same thing where um, B only B knows phi sub B. So he, B takes A's public points and computes the image. So um, both of these uh, guys can, can, do the, can do these computations. And then what they're going to do is they're going to exchange this information. So in Diffie-Hellman, one guy sends g to the a, the other guy sends g to the b. And here, instead, uh, a is going to send this, these three pieces of information, and b is going to send these three pieces of information. And so now what happens is, is that both of them have this kind of extra auxiliary information. And I, I call this extra information because this is something that you don't have in the typical pathfinding problem that I told you about yesterday. This is extra auxiliary stuff. But given this extra information, both A and B can now compute this elliptic curve. Um, and so let me break that down a little bit, what, how they do that and what's going to happen. But once they do that, then since they can both compute this elliptic curve, and J invariant is very easy to compute from the coefficients of a curve, then they can use the J invariant of that elliptic curve as the secret. So there's a couple of things that are happening here that I should probably point out. So re remember, I took L sub A to be equal to 2 and L sub B to be equal to 3. So actually, what happened here was is that this was a walk in the 2 isogeny graph, and this was a walk in the 3 isogeny graph. I put them both on the same diagram here. But they were actually in separate graphs, in a sense. However, um, now flipping over to where, where these guys lie, 
Um, the, these guys are going to be, if you look at, so phi sub a prime is going to be defined by taking the quotient of e sub a by the points generated by, um, generated by uh, applying a's isogeny to b's points and vice versa. So what we're going to use is the fact, so here's a, a very nice, again, kind of group theory to the rescue. There's um, a very nice kind of group theory result that you can prove. And this is what we did in our Win 4 paper. I'm about to show you a slide stating the result. But um, the group theory result is, is that paths of length n in the two isogeny graph actually correspond to taking a quotient by a subgroup which was like a 2 to the n, uh, two to the n subgroup a 2 to the n torsion point. So um, in other words, let's go back to this notation here. These guys were, um, you see, look at these guys, PA and QA. These are L to the m torsion points. And my claim is that you can prove via group theory, which is what we did in our Win 4 paper, that these paths, if you take paths of length m, that are um, L isogenies, each step is an L isogeny. That corresponds to taking one step of an L to the M isogeny. So going back to this, this key exchange diagram, what it means is, is that if you can find this path in the two isogeny graph or in the three isogeny graph, you'll be able to figure out what was that secret torsion point that was L to the M torsion point that was quotiented by. And then knowing that point, you'll be able to complete the key exchange as well. And so even though I'm, uh, I'm basically saying if you can find the path between E and EA or E and EB, then you can break the key exchange. And this is the theorem. So I don't expect you to read all of this. but. Um, let, let me just break this down for, for a minute. So when, when I've, what I've said, all of this is the notation that I've introduced, and this is what's called the supersingular computational Diffie-Hellman problem. And this is the problem that Zhao and DeFeo stated as the hardness assumption for their key exchange. And all that we are observing in our Win 4 paper, and this is with Kastash, Feigen, Mysira, and Puskas, is that um, it's this problem is no harder than the pathfinding problem. In fact, it's easier in the sense that you're giving extra information. You're giving those auxiliary points. So that's what this theorem is, is just said this problem is no harder than this problem because given an algorithm to solve this problem, which finds paths, you can definitely use that to break the key exchange. So. Um, that's, that was basically the, the only thing that I wanted to say about the, the hardness of the key exchange. We don't know. Oh, question? Yes, in fact, I actually think that's what, what something that we should do in the review session this okay. afternoon. I think that would be a great, a great idea. Um, that everybody kind of get fami very familiar with it. Um, was there another question about this? Okay, so luckily, since it's almost 12.30 and almost lunchtime, I'm, I'm almost done. So um, basically what, what, um, what this slide shows is, is that this key exchange is no harder than pathfinding. And what I hope that I've conveyed in this particular lecture is that um, pathfinding in supersingular isogeny graphs is related to this problem in quaternion algebras where there's a lot of extra structure and a lot of beautiful mathematics. So there are, there's possibly you know, more ways that, that this problem could be attacked. In particular, one way that we already know, which is using our pathfinding algorithm in quaternion algebras, we're currently blocked from using that approach because computing endomorphism rings is hard in general. And that was part of what Serena was going to talk about in the um, review session today, too, if, if there's time. Um, but so just because computing endomorphism rings is hard doesn't mean that there isn't some other approach that could be used um, to break this system. 
So the moral of the story, the, the kind of message that I wanted to leave you with is, is that um, we have all these great new mathematical problems to work on, so clearly we need more mathematicians working on them. So I'll end with that. Thank you.